in prison there's this thing that says you do not sleep in prison you always awake because if you sleep in prison things happen and when you wake up the knife that someone stabbed someone else is under your pillow and then they point that you say that it, it, it was him i mean the police come there they lift up your pillow there's the knife what are you going to say i was sleeping you know so it's that type of environment so what if you worked for an organization that has been 200 years in the making adheres to no rules of society abides by no laws and rules with an iron fist and that is the numbers gang in south africa it rules most of the prisons and specifically in this case i'm talking to welcome vitboy and he led 2700 people out of the 7000 inmates at Portsmore prison one of the maximum security prisons in the world and one of the top 10 most dangerous prisons so is there leadership in crisis more than a gang leader in a prison we are constantly under surveillance constantly being judged and have to perform or your life is at stake now today i'm talking to about welcome with boy about that and we talk about how he got into gangs and what that meant and then we move on to the hierarchy where we talk about how does the structure of such a gang or such an organization work because it's been around for a while so how does it police how does it govern how does it operate what are the operational parameters what are the sales parameters um what does your supply chain look like how do you manage all of that and then how do you discipline how do you make choices that you know could cost someone's their life not just that how far do you think that through we talk about loyalty we talk about trust and distrust and who do you trust we also talk about what can we learn from that and do a comparison between that and modern day corporates well i hope you enjoy this session today because i really enjoyed talking to welcome and he is an interesting character in that he's reformed runs his own charity and at the same time is doing his mba what a turnaround and what insights enjoy this with me welcome welcome thank you i'm glad you can join us today i get I, you know what i get that a lot hey when when, when i told you I, I don't know if I, I broke the ice with you when i told you about the, the going to the shop and then when i buy something the lady at the counter always says to me you're welcome and then I always turn to and say, yes, I am. And then she looks at me like, what's this guy's weird. But I'm like, that's my name, you know, so I'm cool. I think it's, it's interesting when you have the a non-traditional name. Because in my name is Ixtin, which is a lot of people don't know how to pronounce that either. So I usually get the, the sort of thing, how do you pronounce it? Then I get where, where are you from? And then I get the... Oh, it sounds like, and that's usually where it goes. So I, I tend to be offered that last bit very quickly. So I just can go, you know what? I used in Afrikaans and in, in Dutch is the same. I said, I used to be a Buxton, okay, but I'm not anymore. So just Xtian, it's fine. <laughs> so, but it's always nice icebreakers, you know, sort of having a chat with people on that. What are you two? It's spelled with an E-K. Um, I just write it with an X and then put a little picture of a brick next to it, you know, so. Uh... <laughs> so anyway, I want to talk to you about, I've been doing some research, not on mainly your background, where you come from, but basically on looking at crisis and leadership in crisis. And so it's one of the reasons I wanted to invite you on the podcast to talk about, I can just imagine that uh, organized criminal enterprise needs organization one it needs leadership two and it works with slightly different mindset but i've never explored what is that different mindset and how is it different and what are the similarities so i just was so glad when you said you're willing to do this conversation because i would like to explore that today and just look at how much of a crisis is a crisis um and how do you lead in it 
and what can we learn from what your experiences have been and maybe apply that in business? Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and, I, and I mean, for me, it's like a disclaimer um, that, that the conversation is not in any way, because I, I, I often get this a lot when, when people listen to my, to my talks. Um, number one, I'm not glorifying the number or the gangs in any way. Um, I'm also not nullifying the, the, the responsibility and accountability that rests upon them and the fact that each man and woman and child needs to change their lives to become law-abiding citizens if they are in gangs. Um, I'm not promoting any gangs. Um, I'll be speaking from my own experience and I'll be sharing uh, from, from my experiences as to what happened to me and why I was there and also what led to, my, uh, to me making that decision to join the gang. Um, and, I, and I mean, for me, I think I, I want to speak in, the, in a bit of like when you become a CEO of a company, <laughs> you, you, have a, you have a journey that you are traveling to become that CEO. You know, you go to leadership college, you, you go to university, you get your MBA, you become, you know, you, you, you study and you qualify to become that individual. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you about the fact that prison is, you know, it's the same. Um, all by it that there's a survival mechanism attached to it. So um, I'll also talk about the fact that in, in business, if you don't reach the deadline, they'll just basically extend it. You know, say, okay, if you don't, you know, if you don't conclude the financial report at the end of the week, we'll extend it for another two days. But please, Jim, please, Extian, it must be in by Friday. But within the prison system, uh, a deadline is literally a deadline. It's figurative. So if you don't reach target, you will die, you know, so they take business quite serious in the underworld. So I'll, I'll un unpack that a bit later, but also getting into the dynamics of um, it being a transparent leadership model. Um, and, it, and, it, and it lingers a lot on transformational and transitional leadership. Okay, that's interesting. So, I mean, um, a deadline in, the, in prison is like a wedding. You don't move it, all right? And it's and but and it's very literal because either you're going to die in the gang or the bride's going to kill you. You you you, you just don't miss the deadline. No. <laughs> I'll also make things a little bit lighter so we don't have to get it make it too serious because I fully understand that neither you nor I condone any crime, criminal activity, or anything contravening laws. We're also not advocating anything that has to do with um, with contributing any international laws or any local laws. Um, but you have the unique experience of having been in a criminal organization um, and the work that you currently do with helping helping youngsters, I think is amazing. Um, and I think that's it's a worthwhile cause. However, we, we're here today to learn from from your past experiences and to see how we can can see the resemblances on the one hand, the differences, and see if we can learn something from that from crisis management. Because I mean, the world is currently in a crisis. If we don't have a war with with Ukraine at the moment, or we don't have a um, pandemic, then the previous one was financial crisis. You know, so this every time there's something that comes up that that shakes up the world and leaders have to adjust. And I think the environment that you were in, the adjustments had to be made quite quickly. And there were very few choices in making those adjustments. It's similar, similar to the military, I think, where you make a, when you get an order and you execute, you don't question. You know, so I was wondering, let's, let's start a little bit with, um, on one hand, how you got into gangs, um, and then look at that as a leadership journey. Basically, how did you, how did you grow through through the organization? Um, anything from is mentorship does mentorship play a role, or um, what kind of coaching do you get, if any? You know, or and, and, and sort of give us take some bit into what it feels like to be there and to be doing the job, you know, or and and, and leading. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, thank you for that. I think that the, the, the start for me is I, I'm, I'm, so everybody knows I'm welcome. And, and I originally come from a, a little Cape Flats community called Bahala Park, which is on the outskirts of, of Cape Town, um, very close to Bishop Levis, Kalkstenfontein, Netrech, that line, Elsie's River. 
And it's a very gang riddled community um, where, where young boys growing up there, my, like myself, we had very few options. You know, um, it's either you become part of the gang or you become a pastor or you go to prison, you know, or you die. Those are your choices. You know, um, wanting to become more than that uh, has always been a struggle because um, I, I remember when we used to grow up in Viala Park, you know, we, we, we used to have all of these uh, gang leaders that we used to look up to, you know, um, and we used to sit at their feet as they were talking. And they, they spoke of education in such a way that it wasn't really respected. Um, they spoke of education as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a tool that white people use to, to dominate and to exploit, um, the black man, you know, or at that time, the colored man, because we're very, uh, specific, you know, you had blacks, you had coloreds, you had whites, you had Indians, you know, um, we weren't regarded as black, um, you know, we regarded as colored. So we had a different way of, of seeing, um, things and we were educated differently. Um, I think for me, I was at a Model C school, which was Spesbona High School, um, where I was fairly uh, a straight A student, um, had a awesome parents. Um, but the only thing with my with my father is that he was he was he was he was there, but he wasn't present. Um, he was he, he wanted the best for me, but in wanting the best for me, he felt like he needed to be more at the office than at home. So he was present, but unavailable, you know, and I think that is why until today, as I told the other day, I don't play soccer or rugby. I have no idea. I, I, I can't understand the reason behind 11 men chasing a ball. I, mean, I, I don't get it. Um, so for me, that's the kind of, you know, the way I grew up, you know, I never really had that opportunity where my dad would sit with me and say, come, um, let's let's go through the rules. Uh, let's just go and you know kick the ball and stuff like that. So he wasn't that type of dad. So because my father wasn't always at home, I used to be out on the streets a lot. You know, I used to see a lot of things, experience a lot of things. And I remember the day when my 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 father said to me, "Right now, you're gonna go and stay with your grandmother, which was Vala Park." And when I got to Vala Park, uh, there was a lot of teasing. You know, I was teased all the time because I used to wear a blazer to school and I used to have all of these stukakis on the side, like, uh, you know, prefect, monitor and all of these things. And I was like a straight A student, so I was smart. And I had this red apple that I got from a teacher that was from the state. She was an intern teacher. Um, and and so, you know, when I came home, uh, kids used to look at me, you know, they used to think I'm weird, I'm strange. And my grandmother used to walk with me all all the place like she used to take me to the shop she used to so i i started to become mommy's boy i started to become a sissy i started to become a moffy they called me all of these names um because they didn't see me as as a man they didn't see me as a boy that was growing up tough they saw me as someone that was being 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 you know like a spongy life a soft life you know um and there were these boys at the shopping center we had a little shopping market called Jawudin in Vahala Park, and they used to stand on the corner and they had their pencils hanging. They spoke a different language. Uh, they looked differently, you know, and, and they were rude. You know, they used to swear people, they used to rob people, they used to, you know, take money from people. And I mean, and they used to even ask people for money and people would give them, you know. So for me, it was like, in a way, they were feared because they were like, you know, these naughty boys on the corner. And and me seeing them and them making fun of me, kind of like weird because in a way I envied them because I saw a sense of freedom in them. I saw a sense of they can do what they want. Um, unlike me, <laughs> I need to go to the shop, home, shop, home, shop, home, school, shop, home, you know. So I had this controlled life of you. You have to be home at, at, at five. You need to do this. So my life was kind of like very much in a, in a, in a pattern. And these boys were were like they were free. They could say what they wanted to say, wear what they wanted to wear. And 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 the thing for me was like that also blew my mind is that um you know when you're growing up and you're a young boy, I'm 12 years old, 13, 14, um, I'm hormonal, I, I wanna have a girlfriend, but girls never look my way. You know, in the cruzara, you know, they don't look at me, I've got my blazer on, they don't see me. But these boys were like, wow, the girls loved them. I was like, okay, that's weird. 
uh, they were into these gangster type of guys and and maybe I was not you know cool enough so there was a lot of things that happened to me as I started looking at these boys so for me it was more of I started envying them wanting to be like them and I knew at some point I I had to in a way talk to them so that I can understand them and I knew that it was, was going to be tough you know because I had a very analytical mind I had a very logical my mind was always you know if I say this what's the response going to be if they make fun of me how am I going to handle it you know um weirdly I grew up and 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 I remember when I was dating this girl not to go off the story but uh, there was this girl that I wanted to date her name was Cindy and um in order to actually get to date her I went to the library and looked for a book that says how to date you know, so that's the type of life I was. Everything for me was like, let me read about it, you know. Um, so so the kids today that, that have these, have Google at, 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 at their fingertips, they don't understand how tough it was for us growing up that time, having to go to the library to read and finding out whether this thing is what it actually is, you know. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, I then started having a conversation with the boys and they did make fun of me. And in a way, they, they, they loved the way I approach them. So they kind of like made me part of them, you know. So uh, I would go to the shop and stay out longer, you know. So I would I would lie to my grandmother and say, I'm going to help a friend of mine with the homework, you know, only to go and stand on this corner so that I can actually also engage and understand and learn. And then all of a sudden, my life started changing, you know. Uh, people started greeting me, um, People started respecting me. Girls started looking at me. My my kind of dress sense also started changing. So I would leave home with my jeans completely, you know, where it needs to be. But when I got out of the house and I was out of sight, my grandmother and my grandfather didn't see me. I would suck Daibruk, you know, and I would put in my role and I would also walk like they walk, talk like they talk. So in a way, I started joining the gangs when I was 12 years old. Um, and that time it was just the street gang. It was just the normal you know robbing old people robbing you know taking 50 cents one rand it was a lot of money that time um and that's what i started doing so um obviously i was raised in a conservative family so there was a lot of you know standards and things that i needed to throw overboard in order to be part of these guys so i had to forget a lot about myself in order to be part of them um what was right was no longer right with them it was now wrong so I had to change my values and not just change them, but actually literally throw them out. Like, this doesn't work, you know. Let's do what they do and just basically focus. And it was the small things that got me, uh, you know, involved. Uh, the, you know, the, the house robberies that I was starting to do, the breaking in was small things, but they had a huge impact, you know, because these, these guys constantly kept testing my loyalty. Because when you join the gang, the only thing that they really, really respect and revere the most is loyalty. And they needed to test it. So they would tell me, go and rob that old lady. Because they knew I had a grandmother. So they wanted to see whether I can decide and whether I could choose to do things that I knew were wrong. But they knew that that was one way of testing my loyalty to them and whether I was Susalasin Afrikaans, I was stared Vienna to be part of them. I was, you know, strong bones to be to be to be part of the gang. So that's how my journey began in the in the in the in the in the gangs. And it was mainly as I said, because of that fact that I had an absent father. So I had a lot of time on my hands. And I had a very trusting grandmother who believed everything that I said. So my lies became dominant. You know, I used to lie and say, Grandma, I'm going to help. Because my marks did not change. I, I, I was naturally smart. So it wasn't as if I failed the term because I was on the streets the whole time. I was like, you know, I could come home, go through my book and just next week write the test and pass. So I was naturally smart. You know, can even hear the way I speak English. I'm very eloquent right now. Bourgeois. <laughs> as they say. But I used to, I, I, I could catch up very quickly. So I had a form of intellect. And I think they knew that, they could see that. But at the same time, they were also trying to influence my thinking, to influence the way I see the world. Um, so for them, education wasn't a good thing. So I, I started being less uh, educated in their presence. 
um, I used to reason stupidly as well because I wanted to belong. So um, if there was arguments that we were having, I was like, you know what, bro, you're right. I agree with you. I didn't argue. I didn't debate. Mind you, I was the chairperson of the debating council at high school that time. So there was a lot of things about myself that I had to let go in order to be part of this group of friends. Um, so I think for me, that's where it all started. That's where it all began. That's just the the, the beginning stages of, of me joining the gangs. Things started becoming more serious when I was introduced to bigger things, where, where, where men started, you know, identifying me um, and, and even coming up to me and seeing that, yo, you've got potential. And I'm talking about gang leaders, people that were operating in the sphere of, of real leadership. You know, as, as boys, 12, 13, 14, we were playing. You know, we weren't a gang. We were just rascals doing whatever, you know. Um, but 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 those those men that were sitting up there were looking down on us and saying, that one has potential. And I think it was at that moment when I was approached and says, do you want to become part of a real gang? And I was like, but wasn't I part of a real gang the whole time? And this guy says, no, now we are going to introduce you to a real gang. So this is where I now started at the age of 16. Now I, I started seeing, okay, cool. So I have to like literally defend a corner. I literally have to take, you know, drugs from point, point A to point B. I started moving packages around uh, in my school bag, put it in there. The police would not search me because I've got my uniform on. So things changed a lot for me. And um, uh, my grandmother never questioned like when I got home late, I was like always saying to, I was helping out somebody at school. I had to stay for homework. I had to do this. But my bag was full of product. When I talk about product, I'm talking about marijuana. I'm talking about Mandrex. I'm like, I was hustling, Brian. I was busy selling and doing my thing. And I remember. I think it's, I think we'll just interrupt you. I think it was just interesting there. So we, we, we've we moved to, I just want to recap something. You when we talk about group forming and, and group identity, that that shift of moving into a different group, um, I don't. I'm not sure. Maybe you could, if you reflect a little bit more from when you were a bit more senior in in in, 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 in uh, when you're making that transition. Um, when you're 16, you're also older than when you're 12. You know, so you you already have a sense of leadership already. Um, at the same time. Um, making fun of other people or belittling them for being different from the way that they, in the way that they talk, the way they reason and so on. Um, do you think it was deliberate in the way that it's a case of somebody tried to influence you? Or do you think it's more a case of people saying, well, that is not the way we do things by belittling that which you do that's different? I think for me, it's like if, 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 I, if I could attach these two dynamics to, to a corporate, it's like when you start at a corporate and you don't know how things are done there. So you come there for the first time and you are told HR gives you this whole, you know, brief on what needs to happen. But in a way, you start seeing when you go on lunch breaks that there's this group that's always together. You see this group that's always together. They do things in a certain way. So you you literally at that moment where you, you're talking at this with this group and you talk with this group and you talk with this group. But you also understand that as you're speaking that you don't belong in this group. You know, because these groups are talking about, you know what, they're talking about Fortune 500 things here, and you don't have that capital to even be there. So you start moving away and you start standing with the ones that are from the middle class. So in, in the gangs, it was the similar situation. You would, with, with, when, I was, when I was 12 years old, I used to be with these boys that used to do stupid things and silly things and just wanting to be noticed. But as I said, there was no real leadership there. It was just us finding our place within the entire big dynamic of what, 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 what it is to be a gangster. You know, um, I remember us even when we called ourselves gangsters when we were 12, people used to laugh at us because they didn't think that we were serious. You know, I mean, robbing an old lady uh, from her groceries, uh, you know, robbing a boy from his one rand, it was like just stupid and it was, it was not really that, that, in my community, that was not regarded as, as, as being gangster. You know, so I think in a corporate, you also get that where you have the whole hardcore uh, people coming together and you know that these ones, they always reach target. They've got like, they are like-minded, they are constantly driven, they are constantly, you know, they, 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 you know, 
they they all have blank uh black credit cards you know and then you get the ones that don't have strangely strangely enough it doesn't quite work like that in corporate because it is it's it's much more loose there is no the hierarchy is not as as rigid anymore okay so yes you have to impress certain people and you have to meet make certain targets but very often it's about who you know um and having someone that has your back somebody that will guide you or mentor you um and help you to understand what is the right way of behaving under certain conditions to make the right impression so i think there's some parallels within that um i'm just thinking was there no pecking order when you were in in the, the let's call it the pre-gang was was there no somebody that said uh, that had more seniority than the rest no 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 there was there was those that were there for longer you know and obviously the longer you were there the more dominant you were you know um so obviously and and it would also be them being the ones telling you what we're going to do today because obviously you needed to have a plan you can't just wake up and stand on the corner of the of the shop the whole day they needed to be what are we going to do today what are we going to you know so there was that type of but like i was saying it was a lot of playing um but not really understanding where it's going to where it's going to end up until someone notices in my case someone noticed my potential and then kind of like recruited me into the real gang so i think it's that thing of when you are playing in the in the in the in the field you know you are playing soccer as a soccer player you're just doing trials you're playing at the school and there's a talent scout there that says wow i see potential there and then you get drafted as a player so for me that was the kind of dynamic that happened there if i used to if i can forget about the the corporate environment for a minute and just use that that soccer analogy but for me it was like that um what if we just just a quick question you you, you mentioned before there was the 26 27 was it 25 26 27 or was it 6 7 to 8 28 that was it um just a question on that so before we go into this discussion on your transitioning into let's call it the the real gangs all right um maybe let's create first sketch and in the environment Okay. So what is the structure let's use the 26 27 and 28 as as a structural element and so and just so we can create an analogy or a metaphor for people to understand how this the system works basically. I think for me like like I would say if you if you were to look at the structure of a business um you would have your CEO, your director, you would have your executive director, you would have your HR, you would have your uh you know your service providers or your distributors you know that's the the kind of you know uh hierarchy you would get in a business setup and then within the gangs you would also get within the numbers gang you would get the 28 would normally be the the ceo or the director of the company uh the 27 would be hr because that's the one that you know lets you in on all the dynamics of how the number actually works and the rules and regulations and the things that you need to you know you need to adhere to and if you don't adhere to it they also enforce so they basically corporate governance and policing at the same time yeah same so time. there's a corporate governance and policing at the same time um but they do everything due with regards to the order from the 28 as to what needs to happen how the situation needs to be executed if somebody has gone against those specific rules and regulations and then obviously the 26s are the money makers they're the ones that sell everything they are the ones that if you need anything in prison if you need a saw they'll sell it to you if you need blood ice they'll sell it to you you know they just make money you know so 26 let's just say so that the 26 would be doing both the sale the logistics the distribution basically as well as the purchasing purchasing actually is 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 organized by the 28s So what would happen is that if you want if you want something to come in from the outside they would they would organize that and get the chain uh connect that so that that specific sure package can get inside you know so they would work on all of those dynamics Okay so so basically they would do agreements on this for this strategic partnership so they would go like we're going to partner with you to supply us within our supply chain of whatever um, item we need then and then you have the 26 is basically picking up and distributing and delivering and collecting the money so does the but where does the how does the money get from let's say um 
I'm a 26. I go and I go sell something. I get money in and that money is going to go somewhere. Um, or do I pay the supplier and then take only the profit and pay, pay it to someone else? Yeah. So what happens is that if, if, if the, if the, the 28 decides that, okay, cool, we've got, let's, let's, let's take it like this. So when I got arrested at the age of, I was arrested at the age of 17 and then I got sentenced. When I got into prison, I did not know how this works. But if you look at it from, from a point of now starting to get involved and starting to understand how it all works, taking it from what you're saying is like the 28 would be the one that says, listen, prison is, is divided into sections. There's various units to a prison. So the prison might have 1,000, 200, 2,500 offenders, but all of them are sleeping in different units. So there might be unit A, unit B, unit C, unit D. But each unit is, is, is monitored by a section head, which is a correctional officer. That person is in charge of the security as well as the safe custody of the inmates. But to get drugs or anything to those specific inmates, it needs to come from the kitchen. Because the kitchen is the only part in the entire prison that has a direct connection to the outside. So if I were to want to get uh, something into prison, I would connect with someone on the outside and that someone on the outside would connect to the person that has to deliver the bread to prison. So that person will say to me, in train number 42, your stuff is there. And then I'll have to make sure that one of the 28s are there outside to collect train number 43. Because if anybody else collects train number 43, they, are, they have no idea what tray 43 has. So if that tray 43 ends up in the head of prison's office, it's like a deep shit. It's going to a lot of nonsense because now people have to explain the merchandise yeah. is gone. So it's a tight, a tight operation. But at the same time, we also need to pay correctional officers to look the other way, you know. But the one that foots the bill is the 28th. And once the 28 gets all the merchandise and the product into the prison, he tells the 26 that, listen, your merchandise, we had to spend so much money to get it in. So from what we have brought in, 75% of what you are selling comes back to us because we took the greater risk of getting it into the prison. If the 26 tries to do this without consulting the 28, then the 27 gets involved and says, brah, you know that you messed up because you wanted to get something to come into the prison without the knowledge of the 28s and you know it doesn't work like that. Then there's hell to pay. So then people that are responsible, that's regarded as illegal trading. And then the law of the 28s then take full effect and it's either your line gets punished or someone has to be taken out to make an example and then the line gets set straight again. So that's how it happens. Yeah. So in essence, you have a supply chain that is tightly regulated that, um, and is a monopoly. The, you, you cannot step outside of that supply chain. Um, but on the, on the product supply side, do you, how much discretion is there on pricing? Or is it just a case of whatever you sell for, we're going to take 75%? Or is it this is the amount of money we want from you? Whatever you sell for is up to you. So, so when I was in prison, my, 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 and I became uh, the uh, higher ranking uh, official within the numbers gang. My, my monthly income was between 500,000 rand. Okay. And it just wasn't about products. There's a lot of other ways to make money in prison. There's prostitution, there's uh, solicitation of information, there's drugs, there's, there's various ways of making money in a place like prison. It's just about how creative can you be and how can you push the boundaries of, of, of that environment? Because like I said, prison is a, is a world on its own and it has a lot of opportunities, but you just need to know how to tap into those opportunities. So do you, so, so talking about those opportunities, who, who spots the opportunities? Are people in the 26, for instance, allowed to come up with ideas and bring ideas forward and say, I think we've got a business idea here and this can make us money? Which is kind of like cool because that happens. You know, you, you, you have. So every morning when, 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 when prisoners wake up, they've got this thing called the line. So they, okay. they check in with each other and they need to let the 28, 27 and 26 
then must let each other know what the plan is for today and what the target is going to be. Every single morning, like clockwork, they wake up, they form the line, and then what is the what is the detail for the day? Who's going to? How many of you are going to school? Because the school is situated outside the prison, and if you're going outside, what are the chances of you, you know, getting things, you know, um, for the Owens? Um, so there's that type of conversation that occurs. And at the end of the day, when we conclude the day, when the day is being concluded, again, a line is formed and everything that has been calculated, like everything that you got for the day is laid bare. It's like, I got 200 rand from this. I got a thousand rand from this. I got 6,000 rand from this. So now you do now that that's the kind of taking stock of the day, you know? So, and then the general does not necessarily stand in that line. He's waiting for a report from two men, Rat and Khlas. They are going to be the ones saying to him, this is the report for the day. This is the takings for the day that we were able to make. And then he will say, he, is he, is he, does he approve? Is he happy? If he's not happy, you know, stuff is going to happen if he's not happy because you did not reach the target. Why did you not reach the target? No, because we've got one collection officer that doesn't want to work. He doesn't want to work with us. He's probably, now he's got a guilty conscience. He doesn't want to do it anymore. You know, this one doesn't want to do this, that one. So now you need to, you know, now you need to fix those things and find out like, okay, cool. And the one that normally fixes those things would be at the last resort, if, if, the, if, the, if the colonels and the captains cannot fix it, then the general then goes and fixes it himself. And he's 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 a he's a person that fixes things with blood. He takes he takes action when he fixes things. He doesn't just you know you don't just call the general to 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 the podium to discuss a little situation. It needs to be dire. It needs to be it needs to be of consequence. And once he steps onto that floor, things are going to happen, and then the record is going to be set straight again, and then life in prison moves on. So we have we, we've talked about three different a few different things. We talked about the twenty six, twenty sevens, and twenty eights, and their roles and responsibilities. But within them, I can assume there's also a hierarchy because you're talking about generals and colonels and and and, and so on and captains. Um, do the twenty sixes have their own hierarchy with the general, or is the generals or other generals always in the twenty eight? So, so the 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 twenty sixes have their own hierarchy. The twenty sevens have their own hierarchy, and the and the and the twenty eights have their own hierarchy. But there can only be one general, so the general is the 28s. So the 28s are the ones that have the general. But everybody else, it's captains, it's colonels, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's stars below the general, you know. So, but they have their own systems of operation. And once a person reaches a stage of becoming a sergeant or a captain, you get mentored into your next position. You know, you, do, you get a, a person called the blackboard that mentors you, that yeah. teaches you things. You know, um, a blackboard yeah. is taken from the word, like what you get at school. It's a blackboard that you write on. So that's where the the, yeah. the, the slang in prison comes from. It's like, when you talk about, I'm going to go and ask my blackboard, it means you're going to ask your teacher, yeah. you know, so that he can make yeah. things clear to you because you don't, maybe you're still learning to become a sergeant. Maybe you're still learning to, because the, the, the prison number is ultimately a, a military system. It's a military hierarchy. You know, it has, it has, as I said, it has a general, it has colonels, it has captains, it has sergeants, it has lieutenants, you know, um, so that's how, and it has soldiers. So that's how it basically is. So each number has its own hierarchy, but the 28 are the highest because of the number being 28, 27, and 26. So we have the hierarchy within the, within the 26, 27, and 28s. The 28s are the only place where, that, where the generals are. So at some point, I assume people must be able to transition from 26 to 27 or from 26 to 28 or 27 to 28 because I assume the, the generals aren't only recruited from it within the ranks of the 28s. The generals, that's the first pool of, of recruitment. Um, you, can't, you can't recruit but by from the 28s or the 27s, you look within your own ranks first. Mm -hmm. A 26 can migrate, become a 27, become a 28, but a 28 can never die. You know, it cannot digress. You cannot become a 27. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it just you can just go up. You can't go down. Doesn't that in prison? There's no Benjamin Button uh, disorder. <laughs> there's also no demotion. The demotions are rather permanent. There's no yeah. So so. So you, you, you recruit from, your, from, from that specific sector. Um, and once the recruitment is accepted, you go on inspection. So they look 
at what you've done before you actually, it's not like, sorry for, for politicians that are listening, but it's not like a big Taylor situation, like, okay, cool, he's got a diploma in, in, in uh, education, let's take him and make him the police. No, it doesn't work like that. If you want to become the general, they look at, do you have fighting experience? Have you been in conflict situations? Have you me mediated over heavy situations? Which other position within a number have you had? Be because you can't just become a general. It doesn't work like that. You need to have extensive experience because right now you're going to be in charge of 2,500 men, 4,000 men. They're going to look up to you. So you cannot have a, a diploma in education to do that. You need to have, you need, if you're going to be a, a general, you need to have, you need to have, uh, you know, warfare built into your system. What is your strategy? Mm. If the 26 decides to attack, what strategy are you going to use to defend? You know, what wall are you mm. going to put up? You know, so you've got to have all of those kind of dynamics. And the last thing, the recruitment is also, are you able to take life? You know, uh, mm. that is the, that's the final, you know, are you able to take life? And if you say yes, then you are tested on that. And you talked about stars. How do you acquire these stars? I assume that is part of the ranking system. Yeah, so each star re uh, requires a life. You need to take mm. the life of a correctional officer in order to obtain a star. So what it normally is in the prison language is that when you, when you, when you, when you take down a correctional officer, you literally take his star on you. So you, you, you take his life, you take his star. That's how you mm. get the star on your shoulder. So mm. when you when you do it continuously, you 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 you, you if your shoulders are now full of stars, you, like obviously you are done. You like you 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 there, so you stop. You know because now you are a general. You don't have to continue doing it unless there's something dire that needs to be written or law needs to be made, and this law needs to be sealed in blood. Then you take blood, okay, or you kill mm. in order to do that. But 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 other than that, it it every star represents blood. Mm. Mm. It sounds like there's a lot of death involved in this in this hierarchy. Yeah, ish. it is a lot, and that's why I'm saying it's like it's the it's it's like you know I, I was trying to create that kind of uh, uh, maybe I, I I watch too much um, Wall Street. You know, I watch what happens in Wall Street, and I'm thinking like when I look at Wall Street and I look at the the prison system, there's a lot of similarities there about dog mm. eat dog and the disloyalty amongst people, people stabbing you in the back and all of these things happening, you know. Um, so for me, it happens within the number as well. There's a lot of, as a general, you don't know who to trust. So you sleep with your one eye open, making sure that everybody that's in your immediate circle, you know them, because if you don't know them, they might be the ones taking you out, you know. So it's that kind of thing. And like, I mean, I don't know for many CEOs out there that if you are working in this tough uh, environment where, you, where, you, where you're working in, I don't know what sector, but it's always a situation of you don't completely trust your colleagues because you know that they all, you know, they all want your position. So it's that kind of thing of constantly being anxious about if I mess up, are they going to cover up for me or are they going to just basically, you know, tell the board and then the board fires me and then somebody else comes and takes my position. Because what I want to talk about here as well is that as much as there's the number, there's also a council. And the council is outside of the prison. They are the actual ones that regulate dynamics and everything that happens. So when Welcome makes 500,000 rand a month, I can't keep the money. The money needs to go outside. So the council are the people that receive the money. It's six men. They all been generals, but they own businesses outside. So they've got businesses in garages. They've got businesses in nightclubs. So that money is taken and put into those businesses. But as a general, you get an incentive from that. So when you leave prison, your incentives are added. And if you've made a certain amount, you get either a house, a car, and tip, you know, depending on how much you've made. So there's a benefit for when you retire, when you leave prison and you go home. But if you retire while in prison, like what I did, I retired from the number while I was in prison, you lose your benefits, you know. So there is that kind of, but you don't hold on to 500,000 rand in prison because obviously... Prison is a cashless uh, no. society, <laughs> yes. you know, so, yes, but that, that money that you send out is used for other things, you know, because it's an underworld. Mm. It needs to operate. It needs to function. So things need to be bought. People need to be paid off. Uh, you know, your, 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 
your family on the outside needs to be taken care of. Certain things need to happen. So there's a lot of dynamics to it, you know, and the less money you bring in, the less unstable your position of authority is in prison. Mm. I'm just I'm just looking. Um, I, I looked at some stuff. There's this book, Kim. I think fellows is her name. Um, but Kim wrote this book um, with someone else called "The CEO Next Door." They also wrote a Harvard Business Review article specifically about leadership in and managing in a crisis. And I've just been using that as a filter when I'm listening to you. And so, one of the things that come to mind is they advocate speed over precision. So when you need to make a decision, you don't you prioritize. So when I listen to you guys talk, we talk about the line and and every day and adapting and deciding what you do for the day, measuring the targets at the end of the day. Um, you're gonna have to do things like doing smart trade offs. You're gonna have to prioritize certain activities over others because on the day it may change. You know, um, you you have accountability and responsibility. You you go out, you do this. This is what your task is for today. If you don't do it, there'll be hell to pay. And we see that in crisis management as well. Those naming the decision makers, making sure that they can execute their or their task, and then holding them accountable. And then um, the only difference is that in a corporate environment, we tend to embrace action, but we don't punish mistakes. And I think in the prison system, I was wondering about that. Do you punish a person making a mistake or do you punish a person for not delivering on their target or their promises? I think it's, 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 it, it goes both ways, you know, and it also depends on the general that's in charge on that day. Because remember, we've got, let's say in the Western Cape, we've got 24 prisons. Okay. So within those 24 prisons, each prison has a general. So how that general operates and how smart and a man of wisdom will listen to the individual that has made the mistake and say, you know what, I'll give you a second chance, you know, but it can also be constituted as weakness. So you got to be very careful as to how you deal with the situation. So if you punish less, you are seen as a weak general. If you punish more, you are seen as a strong general, but also you can get opposition because people don't want to be, you know, so it's constantly having to measure, you know, the kind of, the kind of like, like for, for, from, I can only speak from my own experience when I was in a position of authority, I always listened to the story to understand why this individual could not make target or why this individual did what they did. And then from there, I was able to say, okay, cool. Based on who the individual is, looking at their links, looking at if I were to punish this person in this way, what would the impact be? you know, on the entire, you know, on the, because everybody, you know, every person in prison is linked to someone outside. So you, you need to be very systematic in the way in which you will, you know, you know, punish or, you know, exert your authority, you know, so it's constantly having to think some, 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 some generals that are, and there were many of them that we just really will like willy nilly just decide, you know what, you made a big mistake, kill this guy. You know, but not remember, not realizing that when he leaves prison and he doesn't have the protection of the council, they might also kill him because this person that you killed had a son. You know, this person that you killed had an uncle, this person that you killed had a... So it's a constant having to think about who the person is and all that. But coming back to your question, yes, it does come to a part where you need to look at when you, when you, when you, when there's conflict and there is conflict, for instance, let's say like I made the example of the shipment being 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 um, taken by the by a very integrity based correctional officer. This guy is like, I'm not taking a bribe. This bread that has so much mandrax is not going into the prison. This is going straight to there. That is a that is a loss, a loss that will not be carried by the people that brought this stuff in, but it's a loss that will be carried by the general, because he now has to question the chain below him to find out how was that mistake made. Why wasn't that individual there and why, you know, so now he needs to, they, that's why they have a magistrate in the number. There's a magistrate in the number. That person then sends out an investigator and that investigator will have to investigate and find out was there somebody that pimped, snitched on this? Was, and so everybody's cell phone is going to be taken and messages are going to be checked. 
to make sure that there wasn't a call that was made before or after. So it's a street and like, you know, you can't say, I'm not going to give you my phone. You must give your phone. If you don't give your phone, you automatically assume that you're the snitch, you know? So you give your, your hand, so the investigation goes and it, and, and, and when you're 28, in the 28th, they investigate for eight days. If you're 27, they, 27 will investigate for seven days. 26 will investigate for six days. So every investigation, so the 26th will, will be given opportunity to investigate on their side what happened. 27 will investigate on their side what happened, and then the 28th, and then th those reports will be brought together, and that commission will then decide where the fault was. And if it is that this correctional officer was acting on his own and he was a loose cannon, he does, he's not connected to any of the systems in the prison, then an order will be given to say he must be taken out. And the only person that can do that would be the general. Mm. It's interesting because see you, um, so first before, when you look at the embrace action, punish, punish mistakes, as we started the conversation, um, one of the things you say is punishment is metered out and considered. Um, I think that's different from, from corporate business. In corporate business, people say, this person fired, okay? Um, yes, there might be a third or fourth warning, you know, the, the whole process that you need to follow. Um, but it's very seldom considered what the wider impact is of this person losing their job. Very few people will say, well, okay, I will consider his family and I will consider his family's family and I will consider all these friends at work and I will consider um, what the impact would be on the team. And I think to a certain extent, there's a missed opportunity in corporate business for understanding how team dynamics work and how people relate. Because even in prison, when, you, when you're really under stress, mm -hmm. the people you can trust are, that's a very scarce commodity. So when your team is broken up and you get people that you don't know how to trust yet and you have to reestablish all of that, that creates an impact on the performance of the team. And I'm not sure to what extent that happens in prison, but in business, that, definite, that definitely happens. And so I think it's very interesting to think about what are the consequences of my decisions as a leader, the decisions, one, that I make and the way it will impact the organization, but also when I fire someone. Um, and I like this, this commission. So it's basically almost like a forensic process analysis, looking at where in the process did things fail. The consequences, however, are dire. The, the consequences are not, this is not Mickey Mouse consequences, you know? It's not a Zondo commission and a report saying, okay, cool, these were the people responsible. So let's prevent this from happening. It's, it needs to be taken out. It needs to be, it needs to be cleaned. You know, this individual is responsible. Yeah. That person needs to be taken out. That's the, and I like what you're saying. And, and it's true. And I mean, I haven't, I haven't, um, uh, um, I haven't thought about it within the, within the, within the corporate that much, but what I've come to realize is, is when, when I was a general and I was doing what I was doing is the people that I always gave an opportunity and a chance, those are the ones that came through for me at the end because they could think back about, yo, if it wasn't for welcome, I would not have had this opportunity. He, he took a chance on me. Therefore, there's that kind of loyalty, you know, um, where, where it's built into the system to say, yo, welcome was a cool general. He was like, really, he had my back. You know, he wasn't ruthless. He wasn't, you know. Um, so that, 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 that on its own has a reward at the end. And if the corporate could look at it like that, for instance, like if, a, if, if you were to be a CEO and you have to fire someone, and you considered every element of if you were to fire this person, the children would not be able to go to the school that they were going to. The far, you know, there would be a lot of things that would happen to this specific family. The the loyalty that you could get from that individual would be awesome the minute you need that person. You know, when you at that moment when like there, there's ascendancy that happens within the prison where a general is questioned. And if he has people that has his backing, it is always good. To have people at your that that have your backing that could say no, but he is a man of integrity, you know. Uh, as where they decide, like this guy, you know, the board decides, you know what, we're gonna fire this guy. He's no longer. But then you have people within the company that stands up and says, no, you can't fire the CEO. He did A, B, and C. He's a man of integrity. You know what? He takes care of us as a fair as as a as a business. He takes care of us as people. He, he's got he's got awesome leadership skills. Therefore, don't touch him. But you don't see that in corporate. You see a, a guy who just gets fired, you know, and he goes. But you don't really see the, the, the aftermath. 
there are there there are there, there are consequences in business as well. You you when you get into a certain seniority level within business and you're within a large enough organization, because smaller organizations that have a little bit less than that, um, a person will grow through the ranks, but not just them. Everybody that is ones that they've mentored, people that that they now trust and know that they can deliver, grow up with them. But the problem is the moment that person is fired, the rest can suffer the consequences as well within the organization. Um, because that mentor, that leader that basically helped them is, no, is now gone and now they have to do it on their own. And if they've never been able to make that transition, they're now dependent, okay? And that dependency becomes a problem for them. Um, but what I want to talk about the recruitment in the sense that we, what we see now in the world is a huge shortage of, of, um, of personnel, especially in Western Europe. We have a problem. We have too many jobs and not enough people. To give you an indication, in the Netherlands, there's 370,000 jobs at the moment available, all right? And we have, I think, less than 100,000 people to fill it. Um, if we add all the all the um, the new Ukrainian refugees that's come to the Netherlands, that's only about fifty thousand. And even if all of them could fill any of those jobs, we still will have leftover jobs available. You know, so so there's a shortage of people. So if the corporate business were to have the same harsh punishments, you will even have less people to do the job, you know? So you, let's, say, let's say firing instead of killing someone um, also means you're taking somebody out of the process and out of your business. So now there's even more shortage of people. Um, but do you, in the gangs or specifically in the prisons, when you, when, you, when you look at recruitment, you say the 26s and the 27s are mainly involved in that, is there a shortage of available people or is it more a case of everybody's clamoring to be part of a gang? I think, I think that that is the greatest uh, challenge right now. And I mean, I, I, I understand that, you know, I, I, I'm currently in Johannesburg, right? So, so, and I also work in Cape Town and in Johannesburg, um, but also going into other provinces like Limpompo now becoming, there's a lot of gang activities happening there. PE, there's a lot of gang activities happening there. Um, and And kind of like funny is that, there's a lot of young people wanting to join the gangs because there's a whole lot of opportunities that are created within that environment. So once a, a person is killed in prison that was in a certain position, that position is filled very quickly because there's always a lieutenant, a sergeant, a captain in waiting, you know. Um, so it's never a situation of if you take somebody out, you'll have to wait three or four or five or six or seven or eight or ten months before there's always like you you are easily replaced you know um and 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 you know unlike unlike the the, the corporate outside where you if your uncle is is the ceo uh, he can just bring in his nephew you know or within the government i know I, yeah but uh, this is this is a very south african thing in 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 in, in western europe this yeah, but in south africa it works like it's like if your uncle is a ceo he just brings in his nephew he brings in his so in the number, it doesn't work like that. You know, your, your uncle can be a general, but you are not going to become a general because your uncle was a general. You need to work twice as hard, especially because your uncle was a general. You need to work twice as hard because nepotism is not allowed within the number, you know. Um, so, so those are the kinds of dynamics that happens there. But at the same time, what happens is you also have a situation where you, you have a lot of young people, younger people coming into prison. In the beginning, it was, it was more older, you know, but now, the, the, you know, the, the crimes that are being committed are being committed by a very young people. I mean, in, 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 in one of the communities that I work in, um, the youngest boy that was arrested for being a hitman um, was, 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 you know, 10 years old. And that's like 10. Oh, and he's a hitman already. Yeah which is kind of like sad. So he's going to be charged, mm. but he's going to be at the juvenile detention center until he's 16 and then moved to a medium. And then once he's 18, he's going to be moved to a maximum. So that's the, so when he goes to a maximum, he's already like 20, 21. So he has a better mm. chance of reaching the potential of becoming, like in my case, I was the youngest uh, general uh, in Poland. I was 25 years old when I became a first-star general. And it was the youngest, the youngest recorded in the history 
of, of, of Paul's at that moment because mm -hmm. of my intellect and my way of understanding things and how I could understand languages and all this stuff. I mean, I speak seven languages, so I could understand the type of language and, and the story behind it. So that, 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 that helped me to get, to get into that position much quicker. So, but in the olden days, before my time, you would be, you would be 60, you would be close to 70 in order to reach that position. So it is also where, where CEOs within the number generals are becoming younger. And I don't know what it's like within the, within, within the Western world where the CEOs are no longer 50 or 60, but now they are actually younger. You're 25 years old, this guy really is CEO. I mean, I don't know. But we have this, we, we, for instance, one of the things that we, the original def definition of disruptive technology or disruptive companies was that you start a company, it starts to threaten the current order, and then the current order takes it over. That was sort of the older model. Um, we see now a lot of companies starting rather small and then growing very quickly. And so then the founders tend to become the CEOs, but they don't always have the experience. We call it the founder's trap. So when you found, find a company, you may not grab you on a certain point because you do not have the background, the skill or the experience to do so. And then it, it, it tend to also be that the more successful entrepreneurs are people in their 30s or maybe early 40s. All right, so some of the trends we're seeing at the moment. Um, in large corporate environments that have been around for a long time, you tend to have older people because that's just been, it, it takes a while to grow through the, grow through the ranks because if there are more ranks to grow through, it takes a little bit longer, you know. Um, they are the odd person that will grow fa faster through that and high potentials tend to get a, get, a, get a faster track or get more opportunities to prove themselves, which gives them the opportunity to grow. The thing is, that, that what I want to ask you, though, is when we look at um, an environment under stress, you also have to be able to adapt because the environment can change quite rapidly. So in, in the situation that you were in, in Portsmouth, by the way, wasn't, wasn't there some famous person in, in Portsmouth as well? Yeah, no, uh, Nelson Mandela was it. <laughs> yeah. He was the first, and then he went to Victor Vestad, which was Drakenstein. Correct. Um, yeah, yes. so that's, that's where he was held for, for, for <laughs> not most of his uh, prison term, but for some of his prison term. So it's quite a famous prison worldwide. Oh, but it's not just famous for him having been there. Um, it is also famous for being one of the five most deadliest prisons in the world. Wow. Yeah. So Paulsmo is one of the most five deadliest prisons in the world. And that's, and that's the, and that's the kind of scariest part of it. So, yeah. Mm. So that adapting, um, the thing is there's this constant changing of the guard, because I mean, as you say, it's a deadly, deadly job. You know? Um, so there's constant change with that, but this also changes. You still have to meet your targets, even though the environment might have changed even during the same day. Um, how do you look at people's adaptability? And when you were in position of power, how did you look at what kind of people to put in what kind of positions to allow for adaptability and, and ability to think? on their feet and do stuff. It was actually interesting because um, I think it was de Klerk that said it. Um, uh, he said that adapt or die, you know? So prison is completely about adapting. You need to adapt. Like when I came into prison the first day, I remember I, I was, I might've been a gangster outside a street gangster. But when I got to prison, it was different rules, different ways of doing things. The, the street gangs and the prison gangs were two totally different you know, <laughs> dynamics. So I could not be, I could not be like, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm outside, I'm the man. Prison has that, like, let, let's make an example. Say Extian goes to prison. You might have been a CEO of a multi-billion rand consortium in Johannesburg or in South Africa, and you've been running, you've been going to Dubai, you've been going to wherever. You've just lived the life. The minute you get into prison, you are nothing. No amount of your money or your cars or your whatever you had is going to save you because the person that's actually the king of everything is that berghi that you passed or that homeless person that you kept driving past with your Ferrari who was laying on the side. That person is king. That guy is God in prison. So that's the, that's the kind of 
you know, the kind of adaptability that prison offers. It's like where a homeless person is literally a king in prison. Hence, I like this philosophy that I always preach and I say to people, it's like kindness is the most powerfulest tool that you can have as an individual, as a human being. Because being kind to somebody on the streets, no matter whether giving this person a two rand or five rand and just saying hi, you don't know when you're driving your Ferrari and you get pulled over by the police and they breathalyze you and they say, yeah, bra, you go to, you must go to, 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 uh, to the stockies tonight. You go to the police station and when you're in the police station, they say, listen, unfortunately, it's Friday, only Monday you're going to appear. You need to go through to, to Sun City and lay there for the weekend. So when you're at Sun City, rich as you are, here comes this Berghi who owns prison. And he will know you are the guy that was driving a red Ferrari and you were telling me to piss off and all of these things. And you were being, guys, come here, beat this guy up. Or it could play out differently. He could say, yeah, you know what? You're the guy that gave me that 20 rand. I need a taxi fare to get to where I need to get to. Thank you so much for helping me. Guys, please look after this guy. Make sure that he has everything that he needs. If he needs a, a blankets, give him a blanket. If he needs, because that's how, that's the, that's the power of kindness, not money or authority. That's the, that's the adaptability that I'm speaking about when I talk about prison. It's like, that is what he taught me. He taught me that there's, there's, there's loyalty in prison. I remember, when there was this war that was being fought in prison, in prison, they come to you and say, we are going to kill you. <laughs> they literally tell you that we are going to kill you. You have time to prepare yourself. In the corporate, the people are going to come after you. There's a forensic investigation happening. You just see doors are closed. You don't know what the hell is going on. You don't know that the auditors are there busy working out and mapping out your life. You know what I mean? But in prison, you are told that we are coming for you. There's that type of, that, there's that type of, of loyalty that's within that environment that you know when someone is going to come for you. you there's that transparency, you know, so you have an opportunity to prepare yourself. Um, and I think for me, that's what I've come to understand and learn is that when I came to prison, I needed to adapt. I had to take everything that I knew about my life outside and I had to sit at the feet of my mentor and learn from him. Because he was in prison long before I was there. So I had to sit there and say, cool, so what must I do? What mustn't I do? What must I do? Um, and just to, just to give you a little story is, um, so there was once this guy that came to prison and he didn't know what prison was about. So um, he came into prison. This old man came to him, said to him, are you hungry? The man says, yes, I'm hungry. He says, okay, cool. Here's a plate of food, made it nice and warm, four slices of bread. And all of that, the guy gave him and he ate. The guy said to him, do you smoke? He says, yes, I smoke. So he gave him a cigarette and he gave him Stuyvesant's, bro. Not even RG, Stuyvesant's. And in prison, Stuyvesant's is rare. It's like the most rarest. You just get RGs and those no-name brands. But this guy's giving this boy Stuyvesant's. And he smokes the Stuyvesant. And after this, you want, you want to make coffee? Or you want tea with milk? Makes him a nice cup of coffee with milk. And then he, he, he eats and all of that stuff. 12 o'clock. At night, the old man comes to me and says, listen, I'm hungry. Knowing very well that this boy does not have a kitchen in prison. This boy does not have food in prison. This boy doesn't have anything to give this old man that's asking for food. He says, okay, cool, we don't have the food, no problem. I'm, I, I want my cigarette that I gave you. Do you have my cigarette? He says, no, I don't have a cigarette. I got from you. I don't have a cigarette. And then this guy says, okay, you know what? You have coffee then? He says, no, I don't have coffee. He says, okay. But there's a way that you can give it back to me. You know, there's, don't worry, it's prison. Come, let me show you how you can give it back to me. He goes into his little bed, he draws his, his curtain, and he goes in there with the boy. Moral of the story is that in prison, if somebody comes to you and says and offers you a lot of stuff, chances are that you have to pay it back at some point. And paying it back is not going to be easy. So for me, that's the kind of dynamic, you know, you need to learn very quickly to say, do I trust? Do I not trust? You know, so in prison, when you get to prison, you can't trust immediately. You need to first read prison. That's what my mentor taught me. It's like, welcome. Don't take anything from any prisoner. Everything in prison has a cost. No prisoner has something. That thing has either been borrowed or bought somewhere. And that person has already made, there's a bargain, there's a bet, there's an agreement. You know, that's already been made on this. And if you just jump into it without being aware of it, 
you're gonna you know you're gonna end up in a place that you don't wanna be in so that's the kind of things that so me i had to adapt to that type of understanding read the signs you know when the men start putting on towels around their necks and they start putting towels in the in the in the in the on their arms and they put their jackets on and they put another jacket on i was like what the hell is it so hot outside what is this guy doing only to realize that there's going to be a stabbing you know it, people are going to be they're going to stab and it's going to be a fight so i you need to learn very quickly so that's the adaptability your senses needs to be you cannot be i'm sleeping in prison you know in prison there's this thing that says you do not sleep in prison you always awake because if you sleep in prison things happen and when you wake up the knife that someone stabbed someone else is under your pillow and then they pointed you say that it, it it was him i mean the police come there they lift up your pillow there's the knife what are you going to say i was sleeping you know so it's that type of environment so when we talk about adaptability we talk about it i mean you can even attach that to 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 to, to the corporate you know where you where you trust your colleagues you're both working on a project you know uh and it has a lot of money attached to it. And and because you're so trusting, your your colleagues spend money willy-nilly. They start buying things and, you know, and they just like, you just don't say, you just don't, you know. And then the minute you get uh, audited, everything points because you were just signing. You were just signing because you trusted. You were just signing. And every day you lose your job because you trusted. Yeah, that, uh, in corporate business, we call that somebody stupid, all right? That you, you don't, there's a difference between trusting um because trust is built trust is it, it, we, we have a saying in the netherlands which i actually like it's a trust comes by foot but when it leaves it's on horseback right it goes very fast and it comes very slow so so in that environment that, that's a section i don't think it's it's as, as bad in corporate business but i did find what i do find interesting is as you're describing it i'm thinking back to the time that i was spent in in um, high school hostels um because i was different you know, so um, I'm married to a man today, so that would explain to you how different. Um, but in those days, I was not even close to coming out of the closet. I was so far in it, I was practically living in a place called Narnia. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, <laughs> I was sort of in Aslan's country, you know, sort of even beyond Narnia, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, you kind of go to multiple wardrobes and an in, in ice queen's palace to get there. So the So for me, being different, I wasn't trying to be different but i wasn't seen as being different and so in the hostel a part of that pecking order and 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 hierarchy that's almost forced on you one of the things i got waterboarded they basically or the equivalent thereof they basically put a towel around your neck and around your face and then put you under a shower and put, and just make it wet so you can't breathe you know and then start punching you you know so these kind of almost inhumane punishments is not something that i'm unfamiliar with i don't have to condone it to realize that when we are as humans when we start putting people into little boxes and say well that is who you are um, and that's different from me that we dehumanize people and all of a sudden they have very little value you know so when we are the traitor to the group or the, we're the person that has not adhered to the rules. In essence, we are, we've now placed ourselves out of the, the group's graces, and we also tend to become labeled in a way that makes our human life less human and less life. And I see that happening a lot. So you, if, you're, if you look different, so firstly, color of your skin, you know, um, first thing people notice, um, your hair. You know, how curly or not your hair is, um, if you're male or female, you know, those kind of things are very visible. Being gay is a little bit less visible, so you, you, you don't get to get, tend to get all the discrimination face on. You just have to face it because you hear it, but you don't necessarily react to it. You know? So I, I, I know that we all have these environments in which we, we f will feel discriminated against, we will feel treated badly, and we will feel as if we're less than human. And I'm wondering, so one of my jobs anyway, is to find pe find ways to break those molds, to, to get people to connect irrespective of which little box they're in. Um, but we were talking earlier, getting back a little bit to adapt adaptability, that's what we talked about. And, and so for instance, in high school, I had to adapt as well. I had to conform to what other people thought my behavior should be. 
And I think that's one of the things that we see in, in presence where you were, where we also see in, in, in corporate business is that people adapt. What I found really scary about what you said is that these youngsters go into prison. They've been in um, various juvenile detention centers before they actually go to maximum security. And by the time they get to 21, they, they're in maximum security. Now, at 16, you're still trying to find your place. You're still trying to figure out who's the in and the out group. But from 18 to 27 is when we start learning about relationships. We start learning about intimacy, vulnerability. We're starting to learn when is it okay to say I'm hurt or not, you know. Um, and if all you know is this kind of environment that's so hard and, and, and so compassionless, it is. it must be really devastating on the rest of your life. Because we see that in corporate businesses when people do that, they um, we create in cultures that that they become very very that do not forgive um, and are not compassionate and do not take the consequences into consideration. One of the things you mentioned was the the standing in the line, and so that's also one of the things we look in crisis management. We say that is the direct, direct connection to the front line, understanding what is happening in your business right there at the edges where it meets the customer, for instance. And so, for me, that that is similar to what you were describing. The other thing is reliable reliable delivery. So basically, always make sure that when you deliver, you deliver. You don't you don't skimp on delivery. And it, it sounds to me as if that is a big thing in the gangs as well. Um, so like KPIs, what's your targets, what's your revenue, what's the volume you're going to turn over, you know, things like that. Um, so how many priorities do you think in the line, how many priorities do people have? If, if you send the soldiers out, how many things do they have to achieve for the day? Is it, is it like a small amount, amount or a lot? I think, I think, I think the, 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 the interesting thing that you're mentioning now, Extin, is the, is the fact that people, people have this, this thinking, I think. And and this is so funny because South Africans, they 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 live in a world, or I don't know, it's a bubble, you know, to to an extent of thinking that when people talk about gangs, they you, you think it's hooligans running up and down with knives and guns and chasing after each other. And I don't know, it's like whenever you talk about a gangs, you think like that's it, but it's not. It's 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 a it's a very very organized system it's a very organized well put together dynamic of people that have a goal in mind and they are prepared to do anything in order to achieve that goal grow their claws anywhere into the foundation in order to grow and become and the and the thing that i always start by saying before i answer your question is the fact that the number itself is 286 years old so imagine that culture that old. It surpasses, you know, and for me, it's like I always say people, it's like it has been in our prison system for such a long time. It is the, it's built within the foundation of prison. So it's not a, a stupid thing, you know, it's not a, so when, when people sometimes like when, when, when these guys step out to do their things, like in prison, there's a lot of things that happen. Prison is a community on its own. So it's got its own hospital, it's got its own clinic, it's got its own cleaning staff, it's got its everything is within the environment. So it's a little world in a bigger world. You know, so so every offender knows that every single day, it's either you love to only eat the two slices or the four slices of brown bread they give you and that plate of food, or you can have much more. You need to decide the type of prisoner that you want to be. It's like it's a place where entrepreneurs are born, you know, because I know a guy when I when I when I started understanding the prison life, this guy used to buy two slices of bread by giving an offender a cigarette because he wasn't he wasn't a smoker. So he used to he used to take a gross of cigarettes and used to buy two slices of bread, two slices. So he used to have a lot of bread in his cupboard and then he would package them in such a way that now it becomes loaves and then he would resell these loaves for packets of cigarettes again, you know? So that was his business. So we used to call him the baker, you know, and it was his hustle. And and the generals, they started to respect this guy because when, when, when there wasn't bread in prison, he used to be the one that supplies the bread, you know? So, so he decided as an offender that he's not just going to be content with the meal that he's given by the authorities, but he's going to go a step further. 
you know. And that is what prison actually teaches you. It's like you, you, you have an opportunity, you have a choice to either be content with what you get. But every prisoner had a choice. You, you join the gangs and, and that's your way of surviving prison. You don't join the gangs and then you, it's tougher for you to survive prison because whatever you get at the visit is taken from you. What, whenever you're sitting at the table to eat, they come and they take it from you. Yes, no, you don't have a voice. Nobody comes up for you. And if you run to the correctional officers to complain about it, you'll just get beaten up later on because the correctional officer is not in the room. You know, so they were all of it. So you had to make a decision as to if I join the gangs. But some of them did not join the gangs. They, 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 they. What do you call this thing? They, they uh, persevered. You know, they through all the kicking and being abused. And then, you know, bullies get tired, you know, and they, they find new victims. So, you know, you're no longer victims. So, so, so that's, that's the kind of culture of prison. But when you ask the question of like every, every individual that was in the line, every sergeant, every soldier, every colonel, every, every lieutenant had, had a, a, a schedule, had a, had a to-do list and, the general knew that to do list because the colonels would say to him that Jonathan has to do this, Extian has to do this. So you could literally look at okay, who has done what. So it was that it was a well oiled machine, and people would think like the general just sits back and enjoy the benefits. No, it's about regulating, making sure that this is being done, pushing, um, and and most of the things that happen in prison needed funding. You know, so he had to make sure that he can secure the money to get A, B, and C in place. You know, um, so there was that type of dynamics and everybody had a responsibility. Everybody had a duty to make sure that the number grows to become what it is today. And the truth is, if it wasn't for the number, and I'm not here advocating for the number, but if you look at the American penitentiary and every other prison system in the world, when you go to America and you're arrested and you go into the prison system, there's a lot of gangs there. And these gangs fight all the time. People get, they get thrown off the building, they get thrown off, they get stabbed. A lot of things happen. There is not a, in prison, in South African prisons, there's only three numbers. It's either you join the 26s, 27s, or 28s. If me and you, we were fighting outside, me and you were rivals, and you come to prison, and you become a 28, and I come to prison, and I become a 28, our rivalry stops immediately because now we are brothers. There's no rivalry between us. We can't fight. Okay? So once we leave prison and you're choosing to continue the rivalry, then you can continue. But I mean, if you spend 10 years with me and you've gotten to know me, you won't. You were like, yo, brah, I didn't know that you're such a cool guy. I, I thought you were my enemy. I thought this, I thought that because of the system outside that made us fight each other. But the minute you can't come to the point in prison where you, where you, where you, where you, literally you can't, you, a yaki cannot fight with an American. An American can't fight with a yaki because those are the rival gangs on the streets. So they literally become brothers. So there is no war that's fought in prison. There's no street, you know, uh, things that are being sorted out in prison. It's a complete system where there's law and order and the number rules and becomes dominant in that way. But if you were to, if, if the American system implemented the number system, there would be peace in a way, because then it's just three numbers that control everything. So, so that's, how, that's how the number was able to grow to become what it is for 286 years, because it, had, it, it operated like that, like, a, like, you know what, do this, do that, do that. So what I'm saying is that it's not mindless people sitting in the position of authority. Yes, some of them have got They've got tattoos all over their face. They've got, it's all, it's called, we call it boar spelled lich. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a facade. Look dangerous, but you know why. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's all manipulation. You know, if, if you were to go to prison, you see a guy. In business, we call it branding. <laughs> yeah, you know, in business, you call it branding. You know, and it fools you. It yeah. fools you. So you saw the branding, it was nice, and you bought it. But at the end of the day, it doesn't do half the stuff it was supposed to do. So it's the same with the, so you get this guy who looks scary, but the minute you get to know this guy, you actually come to understand that, wow, this guy is actually, there's a, there's a human element to him, you know? So, so that's the dynamics of, of, of prison that I've come to learn. That's why I took so much from it because it has taught me not just to survive prison, but it has also taught me to do the work that I do today and how to read between the lines. When my kids come to me and they, and they manipulate me. I know like uh, this one is manipulating me because the number says, I 
he's BS how many bail, you know, he's beating with an axe, mm-hmm. he's, you know, he's chop chop you, he's, he's trying to skill you here. So if you are witty and you've been in prison, you can see these things and you can smell a lie. You know, you can, the guys who might come dressed in a nice suit and he comes, he's like, sir, can I just have a moment of your time? And like this one, he's going to sell me nonsense. Then you say to him, uh-uh, I'm not interested, you know. But if you haven't been to prison and this guy comes to you with your, dressed in the suit, you're going you're gonna to give him all your money without even knowing you're giving it to him because he's giving you insurance and he's telling you a lot of stories. So that's the kind of thing is like, Prison has taught me about what is real and what is not real, what to decide and what not to decide, how to choose and how not to choose, to understand the, that I, I can't be living in a bubble, you know, because as South Africans, we live in this bubble. And I'm speaking from a point of being a South African myself. We live in a bubble where we talk about forgiveness, but we have no idea what forgiveness means because we forgive, but yet we, we are choosing not to forget, not realizing that forgiveness comes with a lot of forgetting. Because the only way to go through this process is to say, I forgive you and I'm forgetting and then I move on. But South Africans have this tendency to say, oh, I forgive you. But the minute you bring up the topic, it's back there again. You know, uh, yeah. that is why it takes us so long to get to this thing of, uh, you know, segregation, apartheid. We constantly want to bring it up and all that. Like, but didn't we have this Truth and Reconciliation Commission who said we forgive? But yet at the same time, we constantly bring it up. Prison has taught me like, bruh, let it go. You cannot take this bag of potatoes with you into the world because the minute you do that, you're going to be walking with this heavy burden of unforgiveness and resentment. You need to let it go. And when I started understanding myself from a place of prison, it was I needed to understand that I wanted to my, my victims to forgive me. And I was working on that, like, they must forgive me, they must. So we had this restorative justice program in prison. So you meet yourself. And the most important thing in this program is like, welcome, do you forgive yourself for what you've done? Because that's, that's the only person that's important right now is that you need to forgive yourself. And when I started to understand the nonsense that I did, I was able to take accountability and responsibility for my actions. Then I could go and ask for forgiveness. And if my victim chose not to forgive me, I was like, bro, I'm fine. It's your burden. It's no longer mine. If you're choosing to walk around with an unforgiving heart, it's not my circus, not my monkeys. It's cool. Mina, I'm continuing with my life because I've done my part. I've done my purpose. I've done my... So people sometimes say, well, welcome. Isn't that a bit harsh because you killed a person and you did this and you did that? Yes, I spent time in prison for having done that. There's nothing I can do to bring that person back. But the work that I'm currently doing right now, it, it, it's bringing back thousands of lives, more than the one life that I've taken. It, it saves thousands, countless of lives. So I would be... I'm, I'm more content with my mission then if I had not known, because I would have just been another person in the bubble going around in a flashy car and living it up and not understanding that I actually have a much bigger role to play in my life. I don't want to be those people that you wake up every single day, like work, home, work, home, work, home, work, home. That's your, that's your focus, you know. Um, and I, am, I mean, I'm currently studying at, 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 at Henley Business School, doing my MBA. And, and even being there and doing that business studies, I realized every single day that the type of person that I am, I would have not understood these dynamics if I was not the person that I was in prison. Because now I know the SWOT analysis because I applied it. Now I know the PESTO because I applied it. You know, I know all of these dynamics. I know uh, what systematic thinking is about because I applied it. You know, even though I did not have the textbook in front of me, but I was applying these things in prison. So it it becomes that type of dynamic for me to understand that for me, prison has taught me a lot, but at the same time, it has taken a lot from me. And now I'm spending my time rebuilding, rebranding myself from being a man that takes to a man that gives. Mm. That's a very beautiful sentiment. I think it's also something that leaders all around the world can, can take a leaf from in that we're there. We're here to surf. We're here to find our purpose. We're here to to serve something bigger than ourselves. And at the same time, we need to let go. We need to let go of the past. We need to let go of the things that are holding us back. And part of that has to do with forgiveness. Forgive yourself and forgive others. I think one of the things um, when it comes to forgive and forget, I have a on the forget side. I have a bit of a. I'm not sure if I should forget from, com, forget completely, because part part of forgetting might also mean not not remembering the lessons learned. 
right? And so that's why I think understanding the lesson is important. Um, but that forgiving, that letting go, as a leader, I think it's important to forgive so that you can move forward and be more objective in your decision making. If you're constantly carrying resentment for a person, you will never see their true potential because you always have this lens that you look at them. I've got this little exercise we do on our Friday meetings. It's the last thing we do on the Friday meeting, and it's called, we call it, we call it Stitch. Uh, stitch in time saves nine, you know the saying? So that means a piece of cloth starts tearing, you catch it quickly, and it doesn't tear a lot more, you know? So you, it's also from a leadership perspective, important to know what goes wrong so that you can start putting mitigating circumstances or mitigating actions into place. So rather know it early. And so the exercise we do is we have this little soft toy called Stitch from Lilo and Stitch, the cartoon characters, you know. And um, and Stitch is for forgiveness. It's anybody can say, hi, extend or hi, team. Um, I would like to confess last week I did X wrong, okay. And we all say, speak up and say, Peter, we all forgive you or thank you, we forgive you. And then we never bring that up again, never. As long as it's not illegal or it's not against company policies, we never bring it up again. We Not in the evaluation, nothing, because this person has taken accountability for it. you know. And, and I'd rather have people take accountability and I know in advance what's going to happen and what's going wrong so I can mitigate it than have a surprise two, three weeks down the line and, and not be prepared. And I think this is this kind of transparency that you were talking about earlier in, in, in prison life as well. It's quite interesting to, to see these interesting parallels with the business. And so, yeah, choosing a life um, lived in service of others or helping others, I, I really have to applaud you for making that, that distinction because I know getting out of the life that you were, your life was at stake in that decision. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about how did you get out of it? So it's kind of like interesting because it kind of brings us back to this point of kindness. Um, so, so there was a guy in prison uh, that I met prior to becoming a general that couldn't read or write, and um, he had this letter he was struggling with, and I was like, "Come, let me, let me just help you." And I read the letter for him. I said, "But I, I can see you can't read. Let me teach you how to read, and then I'll also teach you how to write because I had time. And I wasn't a general, and I didn't have a lot of responsibility, so I could actually do that." And then fast forward seven years later, um, as, a, as when you want to leave the number, you need to have four generals present at your hearing, and they need to listen to the reasons as to why you want to step out of being this person of authority. Because you've got tattooed, you, your, your, your ranks, your stars are tattooed on your, on your, on your, they're tattooed like this, they're tattooed on your, on your shoulder. So it's not like I'm leaving <laughs> because they're there, it's like, you know, it's dad, but I was like, you can't just take it and let me just. So you need to get these four generals to come to the prison that you're at, and then they need to have a hearing, a proper hearing. So the two generals serve as the judges. They are standing in front of you. They listen, right in class. And the two behind you, they serve as the executioners. So when you step into the circle, obviously it's an empty cell. There's no other prisoners, just you and these four guys. And you step into the circle naked because generals are paranoid. You might be asking them to come to your prison only to kill them and take the control of their four prisons. So you step into the circle completely naked so you are vulnerable. Mm, mm. So as you're stepping there and you're telling them your story as to why you want to leave, the two behind you, they both have knives. So once the two generals in front, the judges do not agree with your story, they'll stab you in the back, twist the knife, pull it out, and you'll bleed out. But a nice thing happens, though, when you lay on the floor bleeding out and you die within five minutes, is that the prison will close and for eight days will be on lockdown. So for eight days, they will sing songs about you. They'll write poems about you. They'll remember you. Oh, welcome, Mr. Awesome General. Uh, things will add. It will be nice, but you're dead. And then after eight days, somebody else steps into your position. So, and for me, it was like, that's crazy because who wants to be remembered for eight days? Like, really, what legacy do you want to leave behind? It was eight days long. <laughs> Imagine, you've done all of these things for 15, 20 years. And when you're laying on that floor, dying, 
eight days will celebrate you, but they're not going to look at the 15 years of excellence, the money you brought in and all of that stuff. Anyway, so that was my thinking when I was standing there. So as we were talking and I was telling them the reasons as to why, but my main reason why I stepped out of the number was because I was listening to these guys talking in the courtyard and they were talking about raping and killing and when they leave prison, what are they going to do? And I was like, yeah, these guys, they're not going to change their lives. But I was thinking to myself, what if I were to be a father one day? What kind of father am I going to be? How am I going to protect my daughter, you know, against men that think like this, that talk like this, you know, raping women and laughing about it, killing people and laughing about it. So imagine, and, and if I were to be a father to a girl child and my daughter brings a guy home because daughters normally do that. They bring a guy home that assimilates their father. And this guy comes and says, I wear time molecular ear in yak, I mark four, book on my tambos. You know, he starts speaking in that prison language and he has tattoos all over. Am I gonna judge my daughter? I can't because that's who I am. And I was like, no, man, I, I need to change my decision here because this is going to have an impact on my kids. Um, I can't live this life. I cannot continue being this man because this is not a man, this is an example of a man. This is this is a, a figment of what society, the prison environment wants this man to be. And that's not the type of man that I want to be a man of integrity. I want to be a man of honesty. I want to be a man of truth. I want to, I want to be, I want to be honest and I want to be bold about it. And so I said to these guys, that's my truth, guys. That's why I want to leave this nonsense because it's not serving me. There's nothing I'm getting from this. I'm giving you, you're not giving me anything, mm. you know? So the guys like, we respect your decision and all of that stuff. Can you please just step out of the circle so we can deliberate? And as I was stepping out of the circle, uh, circle, the one guy said to me, remember, welcome, seven years ago, you taught me to read and write. It was because of that guy that was now a general who taught, who I taught to read and write. That guy said, I see the potential in your life moving forward. You're going to be a great leader. So we as generals agree, step out. You have no longer, you're no longer going to have power to control. Your command is taken from you. Go. You've got two years left. Go and enjoy the rest of your, 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 your prison term. We will leave you in peace. But what I'm saying is this. If it, no amount of me being brutal or ruthless or being saved me that day, it is that one act of kindness that saved my life. The fact that I took time to teach this guy to read and write, that saved my life. Mm. So I always say this to CEOs and to business people out there driving a flashy car, living in your expensive house. That means nothing compared to the time when you get in front of danger. The way that that person meets you is what that person is going to decide to do. Mm. It's just that. It's just, were you kind enough to this person? Were you, were you generous enough to this person? Did you speak? Did you have a word of kindness to say to this person? That's going to save your life. Uh, you know, people sometimes think kindness is a stupid thing. It's just, ah, it's just kindness. So, you know, why must I be kind? But it's the most powerful thing because it it, it keeps us human. It it allows us to be, you know, like if 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 my daughter says to me, Dad, I, I'm gay, you know, and, and, and I'm like, my baby, I love you, irrespective of whether you're gay or not. For me, it's just important that you're happy. I don't, like, I don't want to stand in your happiness. And I'm like, oh, you can't be gay. <laughs> yeah, look at this, this. No, I'm like, I don't care about society. For me, I care about the happiness of my child. I mm. care about the happiness of my son. I care about the happiness. That's that. That's kindness. That's the saying you are prepared to take your nonsense, put it aside, and allow someone else to resonate, allow somebody else to grow. And that is what saved my life. So that's how I got out of the gangs. And that also prompted me to do the work that I do today. Mm. Well, Welcome. I would like to say thank you so much for joining us today and being with us. I, I think we can have this conversation for another two, three hours going, but um, I think that is where we're going to stop for today. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And I please let people know that uh, they need to follow Bright Spark Foundation. I'll give you the links and everything like yeah. that and to see and follow the work that we do and also support the work that we do. I mean, we really, we, we really rely on people's support for the work that we do because, mm. I mean, South Africa, you know, South Africa, you can't rely on our government. They always make promises. <laughs> so we rely on people yeah. to see what we do and be kind enough to say, how do we support the world moving forward so that we can prevent young people from making the same mistakes that welcome made so that they can have a brighter future and make better decisions 
and not become criminals or become gangsters, but that they can become the actors, the singers, the stars that they want to become. That's the most important thing. That's why we do the work that we do. Yeah. You know, what I'm taking from the conversation with Welcome today is that he actually thought more about the consequences of applying penalties. Yes, in his case, it would mean someone's life very often. But how often in corporate business do we not make that consideration? Do we not think of the impact not only on the person, but their co-workers, everybody that they work with, the performance impact on the organization as a whole or in that department, what mitigating factors we need to put into place? And it's not just about their skill or their ability, but how would it impact the people around them? Do we think about the emotional impact, the relational impact, and the wider impact on that person's family and their friends and associates? What I found interesting is that that is where he went. He thought about those elements before he made his final decision. I'm just wondering if we can learn from that in our modern day corporates, be a little bit more conscious of what our teams and our organizations really need and be decisive, but considerate. Well, I'm Ixin Deval and I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Until the next time. Now go out there, be exponential and do something nice for someone else. You can find us on the web by going to podcast.exponentially.me. We will also find additional media resources and some amazing insights.